Nancy Drew Mystery Stories number 12, The Message in the Hollow Oak, by Carolyn Keene. Copyright 1972, Simon & Schuster. Chapter 1, Indian War Secret. Nancy, said the voice on the phone, you are wanted in New York City. The 18-year-old girl detective looked a bit startled. Was this a joke or true? Why, Aunt Eloise, what for? Eloise Drew laughed at the apprehension in her niece's voice. For a mystery, she replied. Nancy relaxed. Oh, for a moment you had me scared. Your announcement sounded as if I was being brought up on some police charge. Then she added, Tell me about the mystery. That's more to my liking. To Nancy's disappointment, her aunt said it was too long a story to explain over the phone. I was calling to see if you would like to visit me and meet a friend of mine, a detective. He wants some help on a baffling case. Nancy's pulse quickened. She was only an amateur detective. How could she possibly assist a man with professional training and ability in capturing criminals? Aunt Eloise, please tell me more, Nancy pleaded, rumpling the reddish blonde hair that framed her attractive face. No, I'll leave that to my friend. His name is Boyce Osborne. All I can say is that the case involves a trip to Illinois. It sounds interesting, Nancy replied. I'll have to ask Dad if he has made any plans for me this weekend. Her aunt laughed again. We're one step ahead of you. He has already given his permission for you to come. Can you be here sometime tomorrow afternoon? Yes, the young detective answered. See you then, Aunt Eloise. Nancy hung up. She was excited at the thought of a puzzling new case to solve. Going into the Drew's cheerful living room, she exclaimed, Well, the things that go on behind my back. Carson Drew, a prominent lawyer in River Heights, where he and Nancy lived, glanced up from his paper. He was a tall, handsome man who had been a widower since Nancy was three years old. Seeing his daughter's teasing expression, he relaxed. Going visiting? he asked. Of course, she replied. Have you ever known me to turn down a mystery? Maybe Bess or George will drive me to the airport tomorrow. Bess Marvin and her girl cousin George Fane were Nancy's closest friends, and she was eager to tell them about her latest assignment. She secretly hoped that somehow they could be included in it. Nancy hurried to the telephone and called the two girls. Both of them were excited at her news and agreed to take their friend to the airport. After hanging up, Nancy went to the kitchen to tell the housekeeper, Mrs. Hannah Gruen, about the trip to New York. The motherly woman, who had taken care of Nancy since the death of Mrs. Drew, smiled. Please give your aunt my warmest wishes, she said. I certainly will, Nancy replied. The following noon, Bess and George arrived. Bess was a slightly plump blonde with delightful dimples. George, in contrast, was very slender and athletic looking and wore her dark hair short. Both of them had on casual summer dresses. Oh, Nancy! You look neat, exclaimed Bess, as she and her cousin admired the young detective's smart beige suit. After saying goodbye to Hannah, they drove at once to River Heights Airport and Nancy hurried off to catch her plane to New York. By mid-afternoon, she was entering her aunt's apartment house. To Nancy's surprise, the elevator was no longer manned. A self-service car had been installed. It was standing open. She walked in and pushed the fourth floor button. The door closed and the car slowly started upward. 
Halfway between the second and third floors, it stopped suddenly. The next moment, the lights went out. Oh dear, thought Nancy. The power is off. She took a flashlight from her purse and beamed it on the bank of buttons near the door. She pushed one marked emergency, but it did not ring. Now what am I going to do, she asked herself. Without power, there's no way of moving this car. Nancy waited several minutes for the electricity to come back on, but nothing happened. She began to pound on the door. Surely someone would hear the noise and investigate. But no one did. Nancy decided to shout, Help! Help! I'm stuck in the elevator! It seemed to her like a very long time before there was any response. Then faintly, she could hear a man's voice. I've been ringing for the elevator. There must be a power failure. Where are you? Between the second and third floors, Nancy called. Please get me out. Hold on, the man yelled back. There was silence for the next ten minutes, and Nancy became disheartened. Had the man gone off and failed to keep his promise? How long would she be a prisoner? Finally, the stranger called loudly. Can you hear me? Yes, Nancy responded. Is somebody going to start the elevator? I'm afraid not, he called back. I reported this to the superintendent and he called the elevator company. There's nothing they can do. It's a power failure in this part of town. You'll just have to be patient. Nancy stifled a groan. Just as I was about to find out about my new mystery, she said to herself. Then she thought of her aunt and Boyce Osborne. They would be wondering what had become of her. Are you still there? she shouted. Yes. I'm Nancy Drew, and I've come to visit my aunt, Miss Eloise Drew. She lives on the fourth floor. Would you mind going to her apartment and telling her what happened? I'll do it at once, the man promised. By this time, the superintendent had come and other tenants on the third floor had gathered. There were exclamations of, You poor thing! Keep your chin up! I think this is terrible! In a few minutes, a welcome voice called down. Nancy? Aunt Eloise! How relieved Nancy felt. Honey, I'm sorry this had to happen, but I'm sure we'll have you out of there in a little while. Nancy and her aunt kept conversing, and occasionally the neighbors, and even Boyce Osborne came to lend encouragement. An hour went by. Then suddenly, the lights in the elevator came on, and with a sigh of relief, Nancy ascended to the fourth floor. Aunt Eloise greeted her niece with open arms. Miss Drew, a schoolteacher, was tall and lovely looking. She led the girl to her apartment and introduced her to Boyce Osborne, who had gone back. Call me Boycey, as everyone does, he said shaking Nancy's hand. The detective was of medium height. Although he was rugged looking, the man had a very kind face, and Nancy thought his smile was enchanting. How different from many comic strip detectives. I'm looking forward to working with you, Nancy said. Do tell me about the mystery we're to solve together. Boise smiled. Not together, he told her. You are going to solve it yourself. Nancy's eyes opened wide. Alone, she asked. Aunt Eloise spoke up. Suppose you two talk things over while I prepare dinner. After she had left the room, Boise Osborne selected a chair next to Nancy's. First, I must tell you that a group of us detectives have a sort of club. We take our vacations together at the same time every year and compete with one another in solving a mystery. 
Recently, we returned from Illinois, defeated. When I told your aunt about it, she immediately laughed and said, I'll bet my niece could find the message in the hollow oak. The message in the hollow oak? Nancy asked, puckering her forehead. Here is the full story, Boise began. Our club's so-called fun mystery this year turned out to be more baffling than tracking down a criminal. In the river country area around Cairo, Illinois, there is a certain legend about a French missionary from Canada named Père Francois. He is supposed to have hidden a message of great importance. He had been traveling from village to village, converting Algonquin Indians. Then suddenly, the powerful Iroquois swarmed down and nearly annihilated them. This was in 1680. Père Francois escaped, but he had been wounded by an arrow. Later, he was found unconscious by a pioneer many miles from the battle scene. He was nursed by this man and regained consciousness only long enough to say, Valuable message in hollow oak. Then he died. A sad story, Nancy commented. What makes you think the secret message wasn't found, or that the hollow oak hasn't long since been blown over and disintegrated? Boise smiled. I can see that you are a practical young lady with a logical mind. Nancy blushed a little at the compliment and said, Perhaps I inherited these traits from my father. But tell me more of your story. Why did you and your friends give up the search? For one thing, we used up all our vacation time and had to return here, he responded. But we did make a little headway. Apparently, Père Francois wanted to leave a record of the Indian villages he visited. We found a hollow oak which had blown over. On the trunk was a bulging area which we cut away. Underneath the bark was a lead plate with the name Père Francois and the date 1675. Below it was an arrow. There was nothing inside the trunk. Some of us figured out which direction the arrow had originally pointed. We took an easterly course, but before we could locate another hollow oak, it was time for us to go for our plane and fly home. I'm amazed, said Nancy, that a tree 300 years old and hollow in 1675 would have survived all this time. Boise told her that oaks are very sturdy trees and have been known to live for many centuries, so it was not surprising to find one 300 years old. By the way, he added, the oak is the state tree of Illinois. The detective leaned forward in his chair and asked, Would you like to finish the case my friends and I had to abandon? Nancy's eyes danced with excitement. Right now, I can't think of anything I'd rather do more. Good, Boise said, and I wish you all the luck in the world. Aunt Eloise announced dinner was ready. During the meal, the conversation continued about the message in the hollow oak. It certainly sounds interesting, Miss Drew commented. Boise, I just want to ask you one question. Do you think it will be perfectly safe for Nancy to go to that area and undertake a search? The detective took several seconds before answering the question. Finally, he said, There's one thing which perhaps I should warn you about. We detectives had a little trouble with a man named Kit Cadle. He's eager to find the message himself and told one of my friends he wouldn't let anything stand in his way of getting it. End of chapter one.